Graham Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Okay, this week. So we're going to carry on the broad theme that um, I began last week in looking at brand new stuff, uh, which is always nice. Um, I mean, yes, it's nice to sort of look back in time at historical uh, bottlings, but, you know, they're not available, but these are, so you can go out and purchase them if they sound like your cup of tea. Um, and as you can see from the uh, title picture, we're obviously we're back in Sweden, and uh, I make absolutely no apologies for doing another episode of the show on Swedish whisky because I think there's some really exciting whiskies coming out of Sweden at the moment, and um, uh, certainly these two particular distilleries are just continually to astound with the quality of uh, of what they're producing, and. I have nicknames for both of them. Um, now, Pa, uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, is the alchemist. I mean, the man's ability to craft gold from the the, the basic raw materials of whiskey uh, is undeniable, in my opinion. And I'm not just talking about gold, obviously, in, in, in monetary terms. I mean, yes, as soon as his new releases go onto the, the market in Sweden, they just sell within seconds, and um, uh, I can understand why. Uh, it's his ability to, to produce such, you know, whiskies with real complexity and real interest and character, and they're only about four or five years old, you know. I mean, some distilleries haven't got a hope in hell's chance of releasing anything at that kind of age. Uh, well, they, they probably could, but you know, whether it be drinkable or not, of course, is another matter. So, you know, what Pa is doing uh, is, like I say, he, he is the alchemist as far as I'm concerned. And as far as uh, Angela, at um, the master blender at um, uh, MacMyra is concerned, uh, she is definitely the magician. I mean, her ability to craft amazingly complex whiskies from different cast types, uh, different peating levels, and uh, you know all sorts of of interesting stuff that she's got to play with. And the, the, you know, unbalanced is not a word that you would use to describe um, MacMara's whiskies whatsoever. Uh, and you know, like I said, I think uh, I think. Um, uh, I think she's definitely a, definitely a wizard, and and I would probably go as far as saying I think that Angela, as far as I'm concerned, is one of one of one of the best, if not the best, uh, blender uh, master blender that's that's currently plying their trade in the whiskey industry. I, I I can't think of any other blender that sort of like has you know the the, the ability that she has with regards to all these different types of uh, of casks as she plays around with and doesn't create a complete mess. So, um, anyway, as you probably well know, um, I've done episodes of the show on both these distilleries before and spoken about the history and all that kind of stuff, um, so I don't really need to go into that again. So, um, we'll just uh, talk about what we're going to be tasting today. Right, okay, so... Um, Kicking off today's episode of the show, it's it's always a difficult one when um, when you've got a sort of a, a such a diverse array of whiskies uh, to taste, and as you know, I often have a tendency to do well, just do young to old or lowest ABV to highest ABV. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really do that in this this instance, so I've had to do it on style, and so it might seem a little bit odd that I'm kind of jumping around um, and. Um, Starting off with the highest ABV, bizarrely enough. But anyway, uh, hopefully this this will 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 um, make sense to you guys. And uh, uh, I think if I was tasting all of these in one go uh, to write tasting notes, this is certainly the order that I would probably opt to uh, to do them in. And um, while we're talking about tasting, I must admit that the uh, the, the, the the amount of um, sample I got from from Mac Myra was no minuscule you know so so uh, to, to to write the tasting notes I had to uh, sip abstemiously I think is the is the term it's a bit like a, a non drinking tea but uh, anyway uh, I'd just like to say before we start you know again a really big thank you to both distilleries and their agents for the samples for today's uh, episode of the show obviously with without their support I wouldn't be able to do this and entertain you guys and uh, all that kind of stuff so anyway the first bottling we'll be looking at like I said is the, the 
uh, brand spanking new uh, release from Smoke. It's a single cask. Uh, the cask was 18 2012 and bottled at 61.3 percent. It's a, um, uh, as per usual, distilled from heavily peated optic barley and um, the cask was filled in March of 2012 and bottled in May of this year, thus making it five years old. It was a, a fresh bourbon barrel um, and it yielded a grand total of 362 bottles, of which about 90 for the rest of the world and I think two came my way. So, uh, um, and interestingly enough, as soon, pretty much as soon as they arrived in the shop, one went off back to Sweden. Uh, hopefully, you've uh, you've got your uh, your whiskey now, Jimmy, and um, you're a happy bunny. So, uh, anyway, yeah, it's like Coles to Newcastle, really. So, anyway, second bottle we'll be looking at is the first of the trio of um, new bottlings from uh, Mac Myra. This is called the Moment Ledin. Um, right, and the, the blurb kind of goes a bit like this, that uh, Angela and um, uh, Thomas Ledin, who's uh, apparently a Swedish singer-songwriter, and were um, wandering in the caves, as you have a tendency to do so, I suppose, in Sweden, and came upon uh, a couple of um, uh, ex-American oak casks that had been Saturn's seasoned and went, oh my god, these are incredible, we've got to bottle them. Um, now, I don't really know an awful lot about this um, uh, Thomas Ledin, um, apart from he's a Swedish singer-songwriter, and I've not really listened to any of his stuff, and judging from the pictures I've seen of him, he's probably not a singer of a Swedish rock band, shall we say. Um, I think he's a folk singer anyway, but you know. Uh, so basically, yes, they, they, they selected a couple of casts, which I'm assuming means two, and uh, bottled the resulting uh, whiskey at uh, 48%. So um, there you go, that's that's the second bottling that we're going to be looking at. And um, the third one we'll be looking at is again, we're going back to Smogan. Uh, this is um, the Sherry Project 2.1. Now, those of you with long memories might remember that last year, uh, Pa released uh, the Sherry Project 1, which was, I think, four bottlings, uh, each of which were sort of taken from their, I think, original American oak cask, and then they were put into sort of quarters, I think. And it was all about, basically, what the sort of extended maturation period in these quarter casks did to the the, uh, the actual character of the uh, spirit. So it was an interesting experiment. Um, and uh, this is the start of uh, the, the second project, where, and the difference being in, in this instant that uh, this is a vatting of 18 fresh sherry octaves, i.e. You know, very small casks, eighths in actual fact, and um, they were filled in April of 2013 and again bottled in May of this year at four years old. Uh, bottled at 53.6% and there was quite quite a few of these bottles. There was uh, 1,382 uh, of which about 300 odd were for the rest of the world and uh, so I've got a couple in the shop. Well actually no I've only got one now because I sold one the other day. Um, uh, so and then we'll move on to the second of um, the Mac Myra bottlings. This is the seasoned bottling for um, for well, the end of the year. It's just called now I'm going to do my best to pronounce this, but I'm probably going to murder it. So those of you watching from Scandinavia, please. You know, it's called Skort Did. I, I tried. I, I honest, um, which apparently means uh, harvest in Swedish, and um, it's an interesting collaboration between um, the distillery and uh, the uh, Italian wine producer Massi. Uh, you can see his bottles all over the place, and. Uh, um, Quite a number of casks have gone into this. Like I was saying, that I think Angela is uh, is, is the wizard. Um, so the primary casks are uh, first fill um, uh, Contessarara Amaroni casks, uh, first fill ex Bourbon, and first fill Oloroso, uh, and then they use some other casks um, in a smaller volume, apparently. Uh, which included uh, First Fill American Oak, which was uh, Pedro Zimenez seasoned, and First Fill 30 litre Mac Myra Reserve. So, 
quite a lot of disparate elements going into that one. Um, it's bottled at 46.1, which is their pretty much their standard bottling ABV for things other than the Moment series. And finally, we'll be looking at the second of the Moment bottlings. Uh, this is the Horse Bar. Again, hopefully I got that pronunciation somewhere in the in the right area. Um, and course bar uh, apparently means cherry in um, in Swedish. So you can pretty much guess what what that's entailing, can't you? Um, yeah. Again, <coughs> a number of casks. Um, so we have first fill, uh, 128 liter uh, American oak ex Oloroso, then seasoned with. Um, uh, sweet cherry wine. Uh, then we have a uh, 200 litre first fill ex bourbon, again uh, seasoned with sweet cherry wine, and a selection of casks from the Mac Myra 30 litre reserves, uh, including first fill ex bourbon, first fill ex American oak, which had been previously seasoned with Oloroso, and a combination of casks made from ex bourbon and uh, new Swedish oak, so obviously hybrid casks, probably something similar, I would imagine, to what uh, John Glazer at uh, Compass Box is doing, you know, probably American oak body and, and Swedish oak ends, I would imagine, but I'm, I don't know for definite, but anyway, and uh, this is bottled at 47%, so I think this is going to be, um, going to be a really interesting tasting, so uh, um, let's kick off with, uh, with a bit of schmogen then, shall we? <laughs> Right, okay, so let's kick off with the uh, uh, the single cast. This is, like I said, five years old. Wonderful peaty aromas. I mean, I mean, it's not a monster. I mean, yes, it's heavily peated, and but the peat has some lovely dry, dusty elements. It's got some sweeter, almost heathery kind of peaty notes. There's a little bit of honey. A little bit of, of dried fruit, and when I first tasted this, um, before I read what it actually was, uh, it, I thought that there's a possibility it might have been a Saturn's cast. I mean, I know Parr has indeed played around with Saturn's cast, so, um, and there is a, a slight whininess there as well, which kind of led me down that kind of path. Um, but again, I mean, yes, like I said, it's heavily peated, but there's some lovely estuary fruit. There's some pineapple, there's some banana, some apricot. And there's a lovely vibrancy to it. I mean, yes, partly that is down to the high level of alcohol, but it's got a, an almost kind of salty mineral character. Um, and oh, it's just so, so balanced. I mean, all these kind of aromas are kind of interplaying with each other and you get the sort of like the fruit, you get the honey, the oak. Although the oak is actually pretty subtle for a, for a, a fresh um, a fresh cask, but it's right there on the edge, slight milkiness possibly, a little bit of cream. Oh, that is just absolutely stunning, stunning stuff. Let's see what the palate gives. More oak on the palate. Kicks off with the creamy, uh, creamy oak. Oh, there's some alcohol there as well. Um, lots of rich, fleshy fruit come through on the middle. Again, slightly estuary, the pineapple, the banana. Quite delicate peat actually, but the peat kind of runs all the way through it. And again, I'm getting the slightly drier peat, but I'm getting a slightly sweeter peat note as well. A little bit of heather. Getting some coffee, um, some tart tannins right on the finish. Obviously, the alcohol uh, again is giving it that kind of real mineral intensity, uh, or emphasising that real mineral intensity. It's a bit masked, which is not a surprise, but the intensity is just sort of like off the scale. It has to be said. It's like just an explosion of, of flavour in the mouth. It has to be said, and it's all again really amazingly balanced. I'm gonna 
put a little drop of water with it and uh, see what that does. Oop, that might have been a little bit too much, but um, <laughs> oh well, <laughs> done now, isn't it? Uh, let's see what uh, the nose gives us now then. As often as the case with peated mops, and certainly pars is obviously no exception, the peat kind of sort of pulls back and I'm getting more of the more of the spirit notes, um, getting more of the more of the oak as well. I'm getting more of the sort of like the creamy oak. I think personally, I prefer it without water. Um, it does kind of make it a little feel a little simple. Um, what should we say? Less mm, less complex than than uh, than it is when it's neat. Uh, but of course, obviously, that's uh, up to the individual whether you like it that way or not. But uh, yeah, still impressively good. Let's uh, see what the power's like now. Again, the peat has become really delicate and wispy, but oh, that sweet barley note and dusty barley note and dusty peat and mm, oh, that's bloody good. Um, Again, the, the, the oak is quite subtle and it's kind of now comes through more on the finish, less on the, 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 the opening. The opening is more about the sort of the, the, the lovely sweet soft barley notes and the, um, and the fruit um, and the, the sort of peat and the oak kind of come through right on the finish. And um, oh, that is just stunningly good, absolutely amazing. <laughs> Right, okay, so let's move on to the moment leading. Let's see what those gives us on this thing, shall we? Lots and lots of Saturn's character. Whiny, grapey, but underneath all of that, there's just that amazing Mac Myra fruit character. Bananas, apricot, fleshy um, apricots and I just love Mac Myra's uh, inherent fruitiness. I just love this style of whiskey. Um, there's a little bit of American oak, get a little bit of, a little bit of creaminess, but the depth on this is frighteningly good. It is really very, very impressive. Um, and like I said, the Saturns is initially it's got quite a lot of character. I'm getting, like I said, initially you get quite a lot of wininess um, and the honey and um, the earth but it kind of settles down and then all the wonderful Mac Myra character comes out it's a little bit of a little bit of ginger touch of very soft very sweet spice getting a bit of almost kiwi now you know it's got that slightly sort of gooseberry kind of kiwi kind of green hairy fruit kind of note <laughs> honest <laughs> um, damn that is good Let's see what the power's like. Mm. A lot of quite rich oak to start off with, which is subtly creamy, but obviously very noticeable. And the big rush of fruit the sort of almost tropical notes, the honey, a little bit of wininess, almost kind of, almost a bit of botrytis. It's just really, just has this wonderful pure Saturn's kind of character on the mid palate. A little bit of coffee, a little bit of spice, ginger, licorice root possibly. Um, Mm, kind of comes through. Uh, that finish is lovely. Loads and loads of spice. Delicately, elegantly balanced. Uh, a real mouthful. Really deep. That is, mm, that is lovely. Some sherry then, I think. Let's see what the nose gives us on this. Oh, that's big and grapey and whiny. Oh, burnt toffee, tar. Barbecue sauce, um, heather, dusty smoky peat, oh, treacle, almost kind of PX gloopy, 
kind of um, treacly kind of notes. Oh wow, that's uh, that's kind of quite primal, it has to be said. Um, and it just shows you how you don't really need to leave it in a very small sherry cast where it can pick up a lot of a lot of character. And why not pick up? Well, it's picked up a fair amount of colour. Um, I get there is a little bit of of barley kind of coming through, but there really ain't a great deal of distillery character has to be said and um, the sherry is just pristinely clean I mean there is not an off note there whatsoever I mean that is just like a big beefy and barbecuey and oh that's a, a definite winter dram if there ever there was one it has to be said absolutely incredible um, so with Palagas Quite a bit of tannin, coal dust, dry, a lot of, lot of peat actually coming right in on the finish now. Um, the sherry has that sort of interesting kind of combination of, of characteristics. This is the sort of like the slightly herbally drier Oloroso kind of character, but it also has a, a, a rich, treacly, almost PX like um, kind of character. Again, Will barbecue sauce and meat and um, I mean again primal is, is not the word I mean that really is pretty intense and if you love that sort of you know pure intensity of, of, of sherry character I mean yeah I'm, there's a maybe a, a distinct um, or maybe an indistinct as the case may be um, touch of distillery character but pretty much that is all about the sherry and um, that is really intense. I mean, you know, getting a little bit of, of green wood now on the finish, a bit of burnt wood as well. I mean, it just is incredible. It has to be said. I mean, that is that is a seriously complex whiskey. But again, all the complexity is drawn from those very small sherry casts. But even so, I mean, if that's your cup of tea, wow. <laughs> Right, and on to the uh, next Mac Myra, the uh, Schorted, um, probably slurring my words there, I think. Um, anyway, let's uh, see what the nose gives us. Again, classic uh, Mac Myra character. It's estuary and fruity, pineapples, banana, apricot, and again, the, the blending of, of these barrels is absolutely spot on. There's a there's a touch of of sherry dried fruit and the the winey kind of sweet red currenty amarone is just sitting in the background. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things is it is absolutely there's no um, no kind of uh, weird notes which you often have a tendency to get with um, Italian wine casks. Um, Butric, I think, is the the technical term. Um, or as, as a friend of mine once said, would smells like basic. Um, and um, but this certainly doesn't. <laughs> There's absolutely none of that here at all. I mean, it is absolutely gorgeous. It is an immense nose. Like I said, loads of fruit, loads of characters. A little bit of creamy oak, touch of of sherry notes kind of coming through. I mean, this is multi-layered and, like I said, an absolute joy. Um, the skill to sort of like, you know, make sure all these kind of uh, characters kind of work together and one doesn't sort of overpower the other is just absolutely spot on. God, I love this whiskey. This is stunning. Let's see what the palate gives us. Bit more oak on the palate it's not quite so exuberant and fruity there is still obviously a, a fair amount of um of apricot and pineapple and vanilla and um the wininess just is sitting right at the edge there's a bit of dried grape um 
you know, touch of Oloroso kind of coming through as well. Um, bit dry on the finish, but again, there's plenty of weight of fruit and honey and um, slightly sort of creamy oak, just balancing it up. And I like a little bit of dryness, I like a little bit of bitterness as well um, on the finish of my whiskies. But as like I said previously, or in other episodes of the show, you know, as long as it's kind of balanced up by the richness. Um, absolutely fine it's when it's you know <laughs> there's nothing there at all and you're just going <laughs> my mouth and your mouth is kind of drying up it's not quite so fun but this is absolutely stunning again multi-layered uh it just goes on and on and on i mean that is just a stunning whiskey and i mean and that one's not particularly expensive i mean well i suppose one person's expensive is is, is yeah, kind of rel relative i suppose but um retail price of about sort of 73 quid i think is pretty Pretty impressive for a whiskey of that quality, so um mm, mm. And finally we're on to the course bar. Um now it was interesting when um when the rep turned up uh, at the shop and uh, obviously left me some samples, uh, I had the opportunity to taste it there in the shop and when I first tasted this, it was kind of like, yeah, okay, I can smell cherry. I can smell cherry wine, and that's pretty much about it. You know, it, it would just seem to me pretty much one-dimensional. Um, but the problem, the thing is, of course, when I mean, the shop environment is not really conducive to tasting whiskey or analysing whiskey, I, I, I should say. So um, when I got it home and, and had the opportunity to sit in the kitchen and taste it, it I could reflect on it and you know there was so much more to it than cherry wine and um, anyway let's uh, stick notes in the glass now obviously yes there's a lot of cherry notes um, sweet kind of herbally cherry but the that's not the kind of the be all and end all that there's some slightly herbal oloroso a little bit of gritty coffee some lovely creamy oak. In actual fact, I mean, once the, the, the cherry notes kind of just settle down a bit, you know, it really allows the, the, the layers to kind of come out and you start picking up all the other kind of characters. And that is just absolutely fantastic. I mean, yeah, like I said, you know, when I first tasted I thought, oh, this is all a bit one-dimensional, it's a bit of a bit of a cherry monster, uh, as opposed to a cherry monster, but, you know, Give it some time, give it you know, room to kind of unwind and, and a little bit of aeration and oh damn this is a good nose. Let's see what that was like. So it opens up with some syrup coated cherries, a little bit of cinnamon, a um, touch of pepper and then I'm getting a little bit of dried cherry fruit, a little bit of vanilla from the American oak um, and then it kind of comes back with the spices on, on the finish. I mean that is just a beautiful progression um, and but as you well know that's one of the things that I really look for in a whiskey is the progression of flavours. I don't want it to just dump everything onto my palate in one go. Um, I like like for it to kind of unwind, tell the story of, of its production, and this certainly does. Like I said, it kind of kicks off with the with the sort of um, the, the the cherry fruit, the the wininess of, uh, of of that, and then the cask notes kind of come through. There's a little bit of of distillery character also in that sort of fleshy kind of fruity character, um, and then back with the spices, back with a bit of wood notes. I mean that is just absolutely sublime. That is incredible. Um, yes, not particularly cheap, hundred and something odd quid, but ooh, that's good. Right, okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show up. Well, I think on, on this tasting, it just it, it just goes to, to show that you know that 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 that. 
Okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show. Well, I think on the evidence presented, my lord, um, Sweden is producing some bloody good whiskey. Absolutely stunning. I mean, like I said at the beginning of the show, um, they are just... It's, whiskey's just damn good uh, at, at the end of the day. You know, you really need to try it. You know, not necessarily these particular ones, but, I mean, there are... Uh, obviously, you know, entry level ones for for Mac Myra, and um, there are obviously other other Swedish distilleries as well. And um, I'm still angling for that all expenses paid trip to Sweden to go and do some filming and an episode in the caves and all that kind of stuff. So um, I could be waiting a long time, I imagine. But anyway, um, so individually, the, the, the single cask. Uh, Smogan, I mean, that is just absolutely sublime, absolutely stunning. I love that whiskey, that is great. Um, five years old, and just that level of complexity is just very, very impressive. The uh, Moment Leading, yeah, I mean, again, you know, possibly a little bit more straightforward than maybe the, uh, the, the course bar, but still, the depth on that is just stunning. The complexity um, just gained from, you know, the uh, Saturn's um, seasoned cast was just absolutely incredible. Really very, very good. Um, the Sherry Octaves, well, yeah, I mean, if that's your, your kind of thing, I mean, that was that's, that's a big, meaty, beefy, barbecue-y kind of, whoa, you know, it's, Maybe not quite as mad as say something like the Balcones Brimstone or, or something of that ilk, but certainly that's that's a damn big whiskey. It has to be said. Um, the score did. Um, I love that. I thought that was absolutely fantastic. I, again, all those different cast types. The, there's always that possibility that the whininess may become too oppressive, but Angela's just balanced that absolutely fabulously well. I mean, really, absolutely spot on. And at the Korsh bar, um, yeah, that's that that's damn good as well. I mean, yeah, like I said, my initial impressions were that it was all a little bit one-dimensional and a bit too sort of like cherry. Um, but you know, when you actually have the opportunity to sort of study it further, you realise that that's far from the case, and that is just absolutely spot on. So, mmm. Bloody good tasting, I have to say so myself. So, um, like I said, you know, these are all available now from various places, including us. So, you know, if it, uh, um, if they take your fancy, then then get your hands on one, as they say. But anyway, that's pretty much it for today. There's not an awful lot of whiskey left here, so uh, all that's left to say is um, good afternoon and good grabbing.